Hello. Everyone excited they got notebooks? <laughs> I wish we were giving out free robots. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, well, people are still coming in, uh, but let me see by a show of hands, who here really loves robots? Good, good, we've got everybody. And my friend PR2. All right, so you came to the right talk. This is uh, Cloud Robotics. This is a tech talk. And uh, I am Ryan Hickman from Google. I also have with me Damon Kohler. We're both on the Cloud Robotics team at Google, which I'm sure you've never heard of before today. And we have Brian, uh, Brian Gerke and Ken Connolly from Willow Garage. So today I'm going to give you an introduction to what Cloud Robotics is. It's probably something you've never th heard of or thought about in the past. So I'm going to tell you what it is by concept. And then Ken and Brian are going to give you an overview of ROS, an open source platform for robots, and a demo of the PR2 doing some neat tricks. And then Damon is going to talk about work we've done with Willow Garage to port ROS to Android. So your Android apps can run ROS and talk to the amazing PR2. Oh. And then I'm going to close out with a demo of a prototype object recognition service that we created, and then give all of you some action items so that you can all become roboticists. Then we'll stick around for Q&A, and we've also got the feedback link up there if people have been using that, and the hashtags. So what is a cloud-connected robot? If you look at this PR2 over here, it's an amazing machine, but it still has a limited amount of memory and storage space. It cannot know everything. It can't process all the sensors that it has in real time in all the ways that we want it to. It's just limited, even as great as it is. But if you tap into the cloud, we can move some of that perception of the world around the robot, the understanding of what the task it's been given to do is. The robot can share information with other humans and with other robots, and it can react in a smarter way by using brand new cloud services. So how are we going to connect hardware with the cloud? Well, if yesterday you saw the Open Accessory API was announced at the keynote, and some of you might have gone to that talk, hopefully some of you got the ADK development kit. I see some thumbs up. So you can now take the sensors of an Android device, the touch screen, the microphone, the speaker, the gyroscopes, the memory, the processors, and you can use that for a robot. You just need to jack in motors, or, uh, actuators, lights, and give it mobility so you can have an Android app that actually physically interacts with the world. And we think robots are my favorite use case of that new API. So Google also has some cloud services which are really useful for robotics. If you've ever used Google Goggles on your phone, you know that you take a picture of something, and then the phone takes that picture, sends it up to a cloud service, and it's compared against a massive database of potential matches. It's compared to more things than you could ever store on your robot. And then it comes back in, in seconds, and it tells your phone, it tells the app, what was that thing you just took a picture of? Well, that's really powerful for robots. If robots are going to roam around in the world and encounter things that they did not expect to run into, they need to look at them, send that data up into the cloud, and say, robot, this is what you just ran into. This is how you should interact with it. That would be a great cloud service. We also have mapping and navigation services. And if you've ever used turn-by-turn -turn directions on your mobile phone, you know how powerful it is to open your phone and have it know exactly where you are, where you're going, and how to get there. Well, that would also be terrific for robots. Imagine if they knew where they were and how to get where they need to go. They could also know where other robots were and where all the humans were. That would be a great cloud service. And then Google has some competencies with voice and text. So we have voice recognition, optical character recognition, then language translation, and then text-to-speech. And so if you put all of that together, that's going to allow me to say, robot, fetch me a beer instead of doing what Brian is doing today uh, with lots of clicking and typing. So in essence, the cloud is going to enable smarter robots. And it starts with that off-the-shelf hardware, the mobile phones, 
and the tablets of today and commercial sensors that you see on the top of the PR2 and tapping those into a common set of APIs, a common open framework that's going to enable you to solve, to solve hard robotics problems that haven't been solved before because the basics will be taken care of for you now. And using the cloud gives us scalable CPU, memory, and storage. You essentially have unlimited amounts of knowledge that you can tap into, unlimited processing power. You don't have to be worried about your power budget on the robot. You can just send all of that data off to the cloud and have one, 10, 10,000 servers all crunching the data for you. So to give you an overview of ROS and an introduction to what that is and some demos, I'm going to hand it over to Ken. Thank you, Ryan. Hi, everyone. I'm Ken Conley from Willow Garage, and this is my colleague, Brian Gerke. And today, we're going to speak to you about ROS in the cloud. Just like Android provides you tools and libraries to develop applications for smartphones and tablets, ROS does for robots. And just like Android, ROS is completely free and open source for you to customize and extend. We have developers around the world at the top research labs like MIT, Stanford, Berkeley, University of Pennsylvania, Georgia Tech, and much more all providing libraries for you to use with your robot. In fact, there are thousands of them, all the way from low-level sensor drivers to computer vision algorithms to some of the latest and greatest research results being published in conferences today. Now, you may wonder, what can these libraries help me build? A lot of it depends on what your robot looks like. There are ROS runs on robots like the ones here with two arms and a mobile base and a lot of sensors on top. But ROS runs on many other different types of robots, including robots that fly through the air, like quad rotors, as well as robots at sea and um, robots on the ocean, both boats and underneath the water. Some of these robots are built out of plywood and motors by graduate students, and others are ones that you can buy off the shelf and start programming immediately. One of the questions I get most frequently asked about ROS is, what do I need to run ROS? Well, all that depends on what you want to do. If you're going to build your own autonomous car, you're probably going to need some servers in the trunk. But instead, if you're just trying to visualize data from a surfboard, you might be interested in knowing that Rust can run on platforms as small as Arduino, Beagle boards, Panda boards, and other uh, low-cost small platforms. So what is Rust? Well, at its heart, Rust is a message passing system based on an anonymous publish subscribe architecture. In ROS, you have nodes, which are processes, and they communicate with each other over topics, which are usually network sockets. So these nodes can be on one computer or they can be on many. And so to find each other, there is a ROS core, which acts as a name service. ROS has language bindings in a, in a variety of languages, including C++, Python, Lisp, and Java. And it also has command line tools that will let you interact with it directly. So to give you a quick hello world example in ROS, we're going to use a command line tool called ROS Topic. And on the first line, we do a ROS Topic publish to the chatter topic, a string containing hello world, and we're going to publish it 10 times per second. Now, in another terminal or on another computer, you can type ROS topic echo of the chatter topic, and you'll see that data displaying to your screen. So it's pretty simple to just start exchanging messages. Of course, you'd need a lot more than messages to build a robot application, so we provide a lot of functionality as well. We focused on three main areas uh, in ROS for our own development, perception, mobility, and manipulation, because we believe the combination of these three capabilities are what you need to build robots that are meant to interact in environments designed for humans. So if you're navigating around a, a crowded living room and having to avoid people or your cat, or if you're trying to get a robot to do your laundry, you're going to need these capabilities. In order to design these, we also needed a robot. And so we built our own. It's sitting over here to my left. It's called the PR2, and it's built by Willow Garage. We built the PR2 to be a world-class Mobile, mobile manipulation research platform. So all the best researchers out there in robotics would be able to do anything they could dream of with this platform. 
So of course, since it is a research platform, it has a pretty big price tag. It's $400,000. But for all of you in the audience that contribute to open source, we have a discount price of $280,000. So uh, just want to put that out there in case you want to order one. For its brains, it has, it's pretty beefy. It's got two servers in it, each with eight core Intel Xeon processors and 24 gigabytes of RAM. And it's covered head to toe in sensors. It's got seven cameras, multiple laser range finders, and it's got these really awesome arms. And we put these capabilities and computation in there so research would, researchers would really be able to do innovative applications that would get us towards that Jetson's Rosie the Robot future. So here's a video of what some researchers at Berkeley did a year ago with the PR2. They got it to fold towels. When they, when they first published this video, it said 50x on it because it took 25 minutes per towel, which is pretty slow. But just last month, we shot this new video. They have it running five times faster. It only takes between two and six minutes per towel. And they're also able to get rid of a lot of custom hardware they used the first time around. So they're able to approve the performance both in software and the hardware requirements. So fairly soon, these researchers <laughs> This is real, folks. You can do it. <laughs> so these, soon these researchers think that they'll have all the basic problems of laundry solved, from loading the washing machine to empty the dryer to fold in your clouds. But this is a perfect opportunity for the cloud, because fashion, as we know, is constantly changing. So even as these researchers add new features like pants and baby clothes and socks, you want your robot to be able to fold your laundry, whether it's a brand new t-shirt that you got from a conference or a Snuggie you got for Christmas. So now we're going to give you some, a live demo of ROS in action. And I'm going to show you a tool called Arvis, which is probably the most widely used tool in ROS. It's a 3D visualizer. And what we see here on the screen is a model of the PR2. So this is actually connected to this PR2. So as I move it around, we can see that the display on the screen updates. We can add all sorts of 3D data into this view so we can understand what the robot is seeing and, th seeing and thinking. So right here, we see data from this tilting laser. So as you can see, it's able to see and build a, a nice 3D model of the room that we're sitting in. We can also see other sensors. Like on top of the head, we have this connect. We may want to, can we bring the stage lights up real quick? You can see, it's a little dark, but you can see there's, there's some nice 3D color images of people sitting in the front audience. And I'll note, this is, this is just a normal Kinect sitting on the head, so you two can just buy one in from Best Buy or Fry's Electronics and start, get started using the software on your own. Now you may wonder, how do we, what sort of tools do we provide to you to make all of this possible? Because this is actually pretty complicated. We have two different sensors and a complicated robot, and even as I move the head of the robot up and down, you can see that the 3D cloud is correctly moving and re-registering its position in the world. Well, we have libraries in ROS that do that for you automatically, and one of them is called TF, which stands for transforms. So just like in physics, where you need a reference frame to understand your data, in robotics, we call these coordinate frames. And with these coordinate frames, they may be as simple as saying, here's a position on a map. Or I can say something more complicated, like, this is a position one meter in front of my hand. Or I can attach it to data and say, this is data collected from this sensor mounted to this point on the head of my robot. And it will do all the rest for you. So we can see what they look like here. As you can see, there's lots of these on the robot. And they allow us to uh, make math simple so that we can just focus on building applications. So in ROS, the message is the medium. And by that, I mean instead of having code APIs in C++ or Java where you, that you call to make a robot do something, in ROS, you just publish a message, and that will get the robot to do an action. So we're going to run through some quick examples that show you that moving a robot's pretty easy, and you can do it in just, in this case, three lines of Python. So in this example, on the first line, I'm going to create a point, and I'm going to put it one meter in front of the base link, which is one of these coordinate frames I just showed you in the visualizer. On the second line, I'm going to create a message and this message is a point head goal, which will contain this point that I want to have the robot look at. And then on the last line, we're simply going to publish it to a topic that makes the robot move its head.
As you can see, the robot's now looking at the base. Now, with just a couple more lines of code, we can make it do something more interesting. Instead of having it look at the base, I'm going to have it look at the hand. And instead of publishing one message, I'll publish messages 10 times per second so that the robot will be able to track the movement of the hand. So as you can see, it's now looking at the gripper. And as I move it around, in five lines of code, I now have the robot tracking an object. And as you remember before, those coordinate frames could be anywhere, so I can attach those to any sort of object and get the head moving around and tracking it. Now, I started off showing you a Hello World example where it just printed Hello World to the screen, but this is a robot, so it doesn't have a screen to print hello to. It'll have to wave at us instead, which is actually a lot more fun. So this looks a little bit more complicated because instead of creating a point, we're going to create a pose because we have to control the orientation of the arm. But it's actually, this is all actually pretty simple. So for the orientation, we're going to use a quaternion, which is also used in some APIs in Android. And for the rest of it, all we're going to do is take a point a half a meter in front of the side plate of this robot and move it back and forth with a sine wave. So it looks like fancy math, but if you remember sine waves, they just go up and down. We're just going to move one back and forth like this. And now if you run this, well, let's see, we have the robot waving hello at us. And if we run our previous example in another process, we'll see that the head of the robot is now tracking the hand. And this, in a nutshell, is how you program robots with ROS. We have a bunch of nodes, and they each try and do one thing well and no more. And then they can use ROS to communicate with, with each other to do more complex behaviors. So whether you're just trying to get the head of the robot to follow a hand, or if you're trying to fold towels, you can all do it just using ROS. So what, this is obviously a talk about cloud robotics. Well, ROS was designed from the ground up to be distributed. This PR2 has two computers in it, but our original PR2 prototypes had four computers. And we wanted to fully harness that computational power for our applications. But what if you're able to take the nodes that were running in one of these computers and just move them into the cloud instead and take advantage of those object recognition, voice services, mapping and navigation, and other great things that the cloud has to offer? Of course. We can do this, but we want to know why. Well, the main reason is that personal robots need to be inexpensive. Even with my employee discount, I'm probably not going to have a PR2 in my house folding laundry. It's a research platform, and it's very expensive. And so for us to achieve that as robot app developers, we need an inexpensive platform. So what makes robots like the PR2 expensive? Well, one of the main costs is the servers, and not just in terms of dollar costs. The majority of the power in the PR2 goes to powering the computers, not the motors. And if you, if you remove just one of the two computers in the PR2, you double the battery life from two to four hours. So that means computation for robots has cost not just in terms of money, but battery, cooling, and space, all of which are cheap in the cloud. Another thing that makes robots expensive is sensors. Just three years ago when we started uh, creating ROS in the PR2, if you wanted to build your own little robot like this that just saw in two dimensions, you'd have to buy a laser that cost well over $1,000. But just last, mo just last November, Microsoft released the Kinect, which is based on t technology developed by PrimeSense. This was fantastic because suddenly even high schoolers who are shopping at their favorite electronics store could buy a robotics-grade 3D sensor uh, for, for them to develop on at home and on their own desk. We really wanted to leverage the potential of this new device, so we sponsored a contest a month later to see what the developers in our community could do using the ROS, the Connect, and some computer vision libraries that we have. And this is what they came up with. So in this first example, you simply draw some buttons, you press them, and you have your own soundboard. And of course, people also use the Kinect with actual robots. So flying a helicopter around and using the Kinect to find obstacles as well as fly down the middle of a corridor. 
People also used it much like you would use it in a video game. So you wave your arms around, the Kinect tracks you, and you're able to get a robot to mimic your actions identically. So you can perform complex tasks like playing chess or having your robot get, fetch you a tissue. People also used it as a 3D sensor. And so you can use it, you can wave it around and use it to build a 3D map of your environment. Or you can move it around a single object and use it to create a detailed model of just that object. And we think that developers will be able to do a lot of exciting new applications using these, these sorts of technologies. And I should note that everything that you see in this video is open source for you to use and play with yourself. As developers, we know that we need a common hardware platform if we want to become app developers. And so we've done that with a mobile 3D sensing platform that we called TurtleBot. TurtleBot provides you a Kinect, a dual-core Atom netbook, and an iRobot Create base integrated with, complete with open source libraries and tools so that you can start writing robot apps for the home. You may be wondering, what sort of apps can I develop with these sorts of capabilities? So let's look at a Google Street View car, or as I like to call it, a Google Street View robot. Because if you look at it, up top it has uh, cameras so it can take panoramic images. It has lasers so it can see in 3D. It has GPS so it knows where it is. And of course, it can drive around. Well, as it turns out, the TurtleBot has all of these same capabilities, just at a different scale. And that scale is the home. And so you could use it to build your own home view alternative to Street View. And as you have your robot going around, creating panoramic maps of your home, you could feed it to object recognizers in the cloud, which could help you start building an index of the objects in your house. And as we know, if you have a crawler and, you have, and if you have an indexer, you can build a search engine. And so you, at long last, <laughs> you, can have, you can finally find your keys. So there's probably a good reason why we call web crawlers robots. Now, a home search engine would be very different from a web search engine because it would give us a new class of, new class of data as developers to play with. It'll tell us what are the objects in my house, where are they located, where have they been, and it can even give us information about their dimensions, which is all sorts of new data that we can build on top of. And because it is a 3D sensor, we could also use it to create new pipelines from physical to digital back to physical again. So when personal computers first came out, they had dot matrix printers so we could print documents out. And soon after, we had scanners so we could reacquire those documents back into digital form. Well, on the right of this slide, you'll see a Thingomatic from MakerBot, which is a $1,200 3D printer that you and your friends could build for yourselves. So fairly soon, we could use technologies like 3D sensors and 3D printers to create new pipelines in 3D for uh, creating objects and printing them back out again. And also, we want to challenge you as developers to think about if you had a robot that was a mobile 3D sensing platform and you combined it with a smartphone or a tablet, what sort of new applications could you build? What could you do if you were able to combine the libraries, tools, and hardware that you get with Android and you combine it with a robot running ROS. Well, to talk to you about ROS and Android, I'm going to hand it over to Damon Kohler from Google. Thanks, Ken. I'm Damon. Uh, I'm a Googler. And I'm going to talk to you about ROS and Android. So to make ROS work on Android, uh, I spent the last few months working pretty closely with Ken and the rest of Willow Garage to create ROS Java. And ROS Java is the first pure Java implementation of ROS. And that allows us to achieve Android compatibility. So the entire project is open source, just like all the rest of ROS. It's, in a currently, it's currently in an early release under heavy development, but uh, you guys can check it out. And all of the code examples that I'm about to show you are available in their complete form later on the site. So what does a node look like in ROS Java? Well, right now we're going to implement the simple hello world, the first hello world <laughs> that Ken demonstrated. And so we start with a talker node. The talker nodes implement node main. And node main simply gives a main loop entry point to all the nodes. And the main loop entry point takes a node configuration. That configuration contains things like the URI for the ROS core. That's the DNS node. So the publisher node in its main loop takes the node configuration and passes that into the constructor for a new node. And we'll call that node the talker node. 
In that talker node, we'll create a new publisher, and that publisher will take a string message, a raw string message, and it will create the publisher for the chatter topic. Then in a loop, we just simply put the hello world string into that raw string message, and we publish it once per second. So now we need to look at the other side, the subscriber. So we create a new listener node, take the config again, and we create a subscriber for the slash chatter topic. For that subscriber, we have a new message listener, and it expects raw string messages. And then on every new message, we simply print the hello world string that we received to standard out. So to make that work, we use another command line tool from Ross called Ross Run, and we run the two nodes, and then once they both come up, then you'll see hello world printed to standard out once per second. So what does that look like on Android? Well, so here we have the same hello world code uh, with an additional counter that lets you see every time a new message comes in. And this is running entirely on that Android device. So to start that, we have our main activity for Android. And then in that main activity, we create a node runner. And the node runner in this case is taking the place of the ROS run command line tool. And instead of running all of the nodes in separate processes here, we'll run them in separate threads. So in onCreate, we're going, to, we're going to find the ROS text view that we put into the layout, and then we're going to set the topic name for that ROS text view to slash chatter, and that's the, that's the topic that we'll subscribe to, and then we're going to execute it, just like we do with the talker node. So that ROS text view is both an Android text view and a ROS node. So if you actually take a look at the inside of that ROS text view, it extends text view, and it implements node main. So in that text view, we have the topic name and the node for that view. So in the main loop, we take the node, we create a subscriber, we subscribe to the topic name that was set, and then on every new message, we post a new runnable to the UI thread so that we can update the text view text. And that's how that world, hello world works. But hello world's kind of boring, and we have all these cool sensors on Android devices. So in this example, we're actually publishing the orientation of the device to Arviz, and Arviz is visualizing that as a set of coordinates that rotate as the orientation of the phone changes. So in this case, our node will grab the Android sensor service, or the sensor manager, rather, and it will create a new sensor listener for the rotation vector sensor. The rotation vector sensor uh, kindly returns Quaternions, which is the preferred representation of orientation for ROS, so that gets rid of a lot of the work we would have had to do. So every time we get a new sensor event from Android, then we're going to take that quaternion and put it into a ROS quaternion message. And then we're going to use that to create another ROS pose message, which is what Ken was using earlier for the hello world example with the waving. Since we're not tracking the position of the phone, we're going to lock it to the origin, and then we're going to just instead publish its orientation. So on every new sensor event that we get from Android, we publish a new ROS pose stamped message with the orientation of the device. So there's lots of other sensors besides orientation that are useful. Cameras are super useful, and the PR2 has seven of them, like I said. So in this particular example, we were subscribing to the camera from the PR2 and displaying that on the tablet. To do that, we use the ROS image view. And we set up a ROS image view that accepts a compressed image ROS message, and then we set the topic name to slash camera that we want to subscribe to, and then we execute the node. It's easy as that. But, you know, PR2s aren't the only things with cameras. Your Android devices have cameras as well. So in this example, we actually have the camera being published from one device and being subscribed to on the other. To do the camera publishing, we use a ROS camera preview view it gets rid of all the camera code that you would usually write. And we set the topic name that we want to publish those images to, set slash camera, and then we execute the node again. So at this point, what I'd like to do is take all those little demos that I showed you and sort of wrap them up into one package and show you how it actually interacts with the PR2. Is it ready? Great, so if you can see Ken's tablet, that has the camera picture coming from the PR2's head, 
And then if he puts his finger on the screen and changes the orientation of the tablet, the PR2 tracks the orientation of the tablet. So now you're actually inside the head of the PR2. So I've just shown you a couple of the, well, let me switch back, right? Excellent. I've just shown you a few of the possibilities of actually integrating Android devices with advanced robots like the PR2 or, you know, still advanced but easy, <laughs> more accessible robots like the TurtleBot. Uh, but there's lots and lots more options out there. So with the Open Accessory API that was announced yesterday, you can start connecting Android devices directly to actuators and external sensors, but you don't even have to do that. Your Android device has tons of sensors on board already that are exceptionally useful to robots. And now with ROS Java, you can actually connect those robots to your Android devices to take advantage of those things. And in addition, Android devices typically have wireless access. That means that your Android device, when it becomes an integral part of your robot, becomes its link to the cloud. And it becomes the robot's ability, gives the robot the ability to access that unlimited CPU memory and storage that Ryan was talking about. And so with that, I'll give it back to Ryan. All right, thanks, guys. So who in here has written Android apps before? Oh, that's pretty good. There were three competing Android talks right now. Um, who in here has written web apps before? Oh, that's awesome. Who in here has written apps for robots before? Wow, that's incredible. Uh, so we would love to double or triple that, though, and hit all of you. And I hope if you came into this talk not knowing anything about robots, which looked like it was about two-thirds of you, I hope you can now see why tying the robot to Android and then to the cloud means that you're reducing the processing need on the robot, and so you're reducing the battery load on the robot, and so you're reducing the weight of the robot and the cost of the robot. And so the efficiency of reducing all of that while at the same time tapping into new cloud services that make it even do more than it ever did before. So the price performance ratio shift here is pretty dramatic. So I'm gonna give you one demo we put together of object recognition. Since we're not launching any new cloud services today, we're releasing ROS Java today, we wanted to show you what could we do if we took a technology we already had, so we worked with the Google Goggles team, and we wrapped it around a web service and created an API for robots. And what it allowed us to do was to train a custom corpus of images. So you might want your robot to recognize something that's not already in the Google Goggles system, for example. And then once we stored that knowledge in the cloud, any robot could then access it. So what you'll see here is Chaitanya is typing in the name of one of the Android figurines. And we went and labeled them all. So this was the honeycomb figurine. He types in the name on the phone. And then he starts taking pictures of it from different angles. And doing that from the phone and sending those pictures up to the cloud then trains the cloud for what the honeycomb figurine looks like. We also had a web-based interface so that if your, remote, if your robot was remotely at an object, you could still train it. So we did the cupcake bug droid and then hit learn object and train it that way. And then because I like cupcakes, I asked the turtle bot to go find me one. So what you had there was train once on one system, store in the cloud, and then all of the systems can access it. So there's actually a demo of this running live upstairs. Hasbro has Project Phone Docs, which are these small robots with Android phones walking around the table. And when they can get wireless access, they are recognizing different cards, uh, letters on the cards, transformers, autobots, and Decepticons and they run from the Decepticons, and they smile and greet the Autobots. And this is running in the cloud. And we actually had an interesting moment on Monday where we had 15 of the robots out there, and we reset the system when we got here, and none of them knew anything. They were all quite dumb. And then we just took one of them, and we held up the cards, and we trained that one, and then all 15 of them had that knowledge all at the same time. So what robotics problems can you tackle? Well, maybe you are already really good at processing large amounts of data, or someone on your team is good at machine learning. Maybe you have expertise sharing knowledge amongst different users or between different devices. Or maybe you're, you have a very accessible application, 
or you're good with new forms of user interaction. Because it's much better, as I said earlier, to talk to the robot and ask it to fetch you the beer than to walk up to it and grab a mouse and try to click your way there. So what we would like all of you to think about when you leave here is how can you ROS enable your web service or application? It's great if it's open source, but it doesn't have to be. This could be a new form of business, which is launching new APIs for robotics that process information in a special way that solve a real world problem. And we want you to think about ROS enabling Android apps. So you can use ROS Java, and you can write an app with views and user interfaces that are doing complex robotic processing behind the scenes and also connecting with hardware and actuators. And then you can put those apps in the market and distribute them out to any of the 50 plus platforms that support ROS today. And I'm sure many more will come online when people start connecting hardware to Android in new ways. And you don't have to go through Android. You could take the PR2 and give it a direct cloud connection. You could take any sensor, give it a network ID, tap it into a cloud service, and it adds to the system. So to get started, go to cloudrobotics.com. That's gonna take you to the Ross Java site where you can download that. You can see the tutorials that Ken and uh, Damon showed you today. And if you haven't already been there yet, we want you to come upstairs to the third floor in the Android Interactive Zone. We have the turtle bots running around. You can touch them. You can talk to some of the folks from Willow. We also have Hasbro there with the project phone docs, and you can play with those and uh, see how those work. And then for you still in the Bay Area 10 days from now, we'll be at the Maker Fair, which is a chance for you to see more do-it-yourself and hobbyist devices connected to Android, running ROS, connected to the cloud. So we're gonna stick around for some Q&A, but I wanna thank all of my presenters today and the PR2 for uh, letting us demo it. Great. So if uh, anyone has questions, uh, please just come up to the mic and uh, just speak up, and we're happy to answer them. That's fine. We hear you. Okay. Uh, quick one on Ross Java. Um, is it a pure Java implementation, or are there some native dependencies on that? That's a pure Java implementation of Ross. Awesome. Any, any plans on supporting other language findings? I, I know Damon started the scripting layer for Android, you know, with, so you can run Python and do a, stuff like that. Uh, Ross actually has quite a few language bindings. I think Ken could probably rattle them off for you. So the, the first class ones are C++ and Python, but we also, and Lisp, and we also have experimental support for Lua. But I, I on the Android itself. Uh, I'll be working on Ross Java for the foreseeable future. Go ahead. With the, the realm of unmanned ground vehicles, how would you compare or contrast like you guys' direction in terms of Ross with you know, your Northrop Grumman's, your Lockheed's that are working on that problem? And they, you know, are there some kind of cloud services that could be specifically useful for that? Yeah, I definitely think cloud services are useful to robots as a whole. And uh, what we've seen is military developments in the past turned commercial, whether it was satellites or going to the moon. And uh, I think it's GPS, uh, or I would say inertial measurement units on, on missiles are now in your Wiimote, and it's a $10 chip, and it used to be $60,000. So all of those things are turning into commercial, low-cost devices that all of us can then afford. And what's happening is more and more of the basics of robotics are just being taken care of for you, and then new people are tackling the hard problems um, as they come about. Um, so it seems a natural question that have you talked to Commander Pike about using Go in this environment? I'm sure he'd be disappointed if the answer is no. <laughs> I have not had conversations with Commander Pike. Yeah, because it seems like Go would be real, with the way it's set up with channels and Go routines and stuff like that, it seems like it'd be a very natural fit where you could delegate to an army of robots and they kind of work it out amongst themselves, who does what kind of thing. So uh, I think a, uh, a great contribution for somebody who knows Go and is interested in robots would be to write the first Go client for Ross. If only Go had a way to talk to Java, though. <laughs> all right. Any more questions? No? Well, thank you all for coming. <laughs>